right, sorry about that. It was a, a missing video, but we'll, instead of me singing a cappella for an impromptu special music, I think we should just go right into our message for the day. Let me ask you something. Have you ever had a friend that you loved dearly and you enjoyed being around them, but sometimes you just felt a little nervous with them in certain social situations because you weren't sure what was going to come out of their mouth or you weren't sure if they were going to remember their manners at a nice restaurant or you weren't sure if they were going to trip and knock something over at the restaurant and embarrass everyone. Has that happened to you before? And please don't you know, look to the people around you. Or maybe you were that person and you heard th you've heard those words that were half joking, half serious, where they say, I can't take you anywhere. Look at what you did. And like I say, usually it's joking, but there's kind of an element of truth. Imagine for a moment that you were invited to a very fancy dinner and there was someone there that you wanted to impress and you could invite somebody and you had that one friend that was kind of a loose cannon and you never knew what was going to happen, would you be inclined to invite them or maybe somebody that was a little more reliable in the social setting? You probably would be tempted to not go with that one friend, even though you love them, and go with someone else. And it occurred to me as I was preparing for this week's message that when you look back at the story of Peter, because Peter is featured in our two short stories for this morning. Peter is featured uh, in a lot of other stories, and Peter is kind of that knucklehead that you just don't know what's going to come out of his mouth. You don't know what he's going to do or say. Um, and yet God called him in that state uh, to use him. Think about some of the things that Peter did and Peter said. Can you think of any awkward moments that Peter created, like Maybe when he asked Jesus to call him out onto the water, and then he started walking on the water, and then he gets overconfident, he looks back at his buddies, and he almost drowns. That's kind of awkward. <laughs> That's an odd situation. What else did Peter do or say? Can you, just, you could just shout it out. That was a little bit awkward at times. Yeah, he cut off Malchus's ear. Uh, Jesus is about to be arrested, Oh, Peter produces a sword and whoosh, no more ear, which Jesus puts back on the guy and says, it's okay. That was a little unexpected, a little awkward. Not something you want to have happen at your dinner party. What else did Peter do? Oh, yeah. He said, Jesus, everybody else, they may deny you, but I will never deny you. I'll die for you. And then what's he go and do? <coughs> he goes and denies Jesus three times. He even like curses a whole bunch so that the people wouldn't think that he was a follower of Jesus. Um, boy, can't bring that Peter guy anywhere, can we? What else did, did Peter do or say? Can you think of... Oh, yes, Jesus is preparing to wash his feet, and Peter's like, I will never let you wash my feet. And then Jesus says, if I don't do this, you don't have a part of me. So he's like, well, give me an entire bath then. Come on, Peter. What are you thinking? Uh, there are these moments <coughs> in Peter's journey. I'm going to get a little water here. Maybe Peter had a coughing fit <laughs> while doing a sermon. So they say um, public speaking is people's worst fear. I like public speaking, but I don't like when this happens. And I'm not sick, by the way. So Peter, in some cases, seemed to be more of a liability 
than an asset. Don't know what he's going to say. Don't know what he's going to do. Are you sure, Jesus, that you picked the right apostle? Did you pick the right disciple, Jesus? Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Because in these short stories, Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 32, we get a glimpse of a Peter that has grown. Peter that has been experiencing the transforming love and power of Jesus. Called while he was still green and really rough around the edges, still a little bit rough around the edges, but he has grown so much. Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 2. It says, and it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwelt at Lydda. Peter is not just preaching and teaching in Jerusalem. Peter is starting to obey this command to go elsewhere. He's going throughout the countryside telling the good news. He goes about a day's journey from Jerusalem closer to the coast. There in Lydda, to the saints who were there. Now, this isn't too terribly long after the resurrection of Jesus. So how are there already Christian believers there? Probably because Philip, the evangelist, uh, some might call him the deacon, he was already ahead of the way. The very road that, that Philip would have traveled to get to his destinations is, passes right through the town of Lydda. And you know Philip, the evangelist, had preached there. So these are probably believers from Philip that, that Peter is now going down to speak to and to encourage. Verse 33, and he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for how many years? Eight years, and he was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Peter heals you. No? Thanks, Clary. What does it say there? Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, heals you. That, this is the same Peter who was in the group of disciples talking about who's the greatest. Well, I'm the best disciple. We don't know the exact conversation, but you better believe he was in that discussion. And now Peter wants to make sure everybody knows who's doing the healing. It's not Peter, it's Jesus. Uh, this is a changed man, a growing man. Now, please note, when we talk about Peter being changed, it wasn't that, that God, like, reformatted the hard drive of his, of his mind and gave him a brand new personality and character and so forth. God doesn't want to do that. We have wonderful aspects of our character and our personality that are, that are valuable for God's kingdom, but there are areas where Jesus wants us to grow. And Peter maybe got into trouble sometimes because he dove too eagerly and passionately into things without thinking about it. Remember even on the Mount of Transfiguration where he, he starts speaking, uh, well, let's make some tabernacles here, one for each of you. And, and, and the author narrating it says, he said this because he didn't know what else to say. He just started speaking uh, extemporaneously to fill the silence. But, but that same quality of Peter with his willingness to embrace and dive into things and passionately accept them is part of what made him such a great apostle. And so Jesus is merely refocusing and, and enhancing some of these personality traits and characteristics and pointing them in the right direction for God. And so here he has an opportunity to heal someone because the gift of healing had been given to him. And he says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. It wasn't that Peter was a neat freak and was saying, man, you got to make your bed. But this was something that had been done for Aeneas every single day for those eight years. He couldn't do it himself. And now he's saying, do for yourself what you couldn't do before. He rose immediately. And all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to whom? They turned to the Lord. 
That's where Peter wanted the focus to go, and that's where people turned. Story number two starts in verse 36. At Joppa. Joppa is about 10 miles away. Joppa was a port on the coast. Uh, it wasn't a very good port. It was kind of treacherous, I've been told through my reading, to get into the port. But nevertheless, it was an important port city. There, there were no natural ports. They had to, to build them themselves in, in Israel. And there he, had, he met a certain disciple named what? Tabitha, which is also translated as what? Dorcas. Now, maybe some of you have heard the word Dorcas before. We call our community services center often Dorcas. It's because it's named after this lady who was always doing good and helping other people. When, when we get to heaven someday and we get to see Tabitha or Dorcas, she is going to be so shocked that there are thousands of community service centers or more, hundreds of thousands, that have her name on it. Whoa, this humble woman is going to be maybe a little red in the cheeks when she sees with embarrassment, whoa, you named it after me? Because she wasn't about that attention. She just was about helping people. Now, by the way, if people know you in two different languages, if they know your name in two different languages, what does that indicate about you? Maybe you could speak two languages, or your friends speak two different languages. If people say, hey, John, and then uh, other people call me Juan, Juanito, or whatever. Uh, I have friends that are from different backgrounds, different ethnicities. The early Christian church, as you recall, had different backgrounds. There were people who were dyed in the wool, Hebrew-speaking Jews, uh, and there were converts that were starting to come in from Greek-speaking backgrounds, and then there were the Greek-speaking Jews. But it's cool that here's a woman who apparently was friends with everybody. Whether you, you spoke Aramaic uh, or Hebrew, you had a friend in Dorcas. Uh, whether you spoke Greek, you had a friend in Tabitha. This woman, uh, according to verse 36, was full of what? Full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. She was a do-gooder in the best sense of the phrase. She was just always doing good. Here's a need. Uh, I, can, I can help with that. You need a cloak? I can make you one. Uh, her sewing machine uh, isn't like what we have here today, but she was eager to do good and help others. Unfortunately, she didn't have the gift of healing. She had the gift, gift of helps, and others, but she didn't have the gift of healing because 37 tells us it happened in those days she became sick and did what? She died. She couldn't heal herself, even though she was a spirit-filled believer just as much as Peter was. And when they had washed her, there was a ceremonial washing that they did. It says they laid her in an upper room. In Jerusalem at the time, it was customary to bury people on the same day that they died. Outside of Jerusalem, they might wait up to three days to bury someone who had been deceased. Part of this was they wanted to make sure that they were good and dead and not just kind of dead and weren't going to resuscitate. And they would lay them in the uppermost spot underneath the roof. And there she was. So she was there in the upper room, verse 36. And since Lydda was near Joppa, about 10 miles away, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. And they sent two young or two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. So they heard Peter was nearby, but because Peter had been growing in the grace of Jesus, he was an asset and not a liability. You can imagine them saying, Oh, Peter, what the ear cutter offer? We don't need him here. We need her, both ears on her. Here, what's he going to do? Curse? No. They had heard that Peter was being changed. And they wanted him to be there. 
this is awesome. I think sometimes we miss these sorts of details because we, we know, oh, that's where he got to. But let's think about his past. Oh, Peter the Jesus denier? We don't need him around here. No, Peter had been changed. And so they sent for him. Uh, perhaps before she had died, uh, or maybe even after the fact. Uh, come, while there's time, because they knew that Peter had been given the gift of healing. Uh, he had been uh, given the Holy Spirit in a powerful way for that specific gift. And so it says in verse 39, Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by weeping, showing the, the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Dorcas may have herself been a widow. We don't know specifically, but she was friends with a lot of the widows. Uh, the people that, that uh, didn't have a husband, didn't have maybe a family to, to look after them, Dorcas was looking after them. Tabitha, she had an eye looking out for them. And so these people in particular were the ones that were especially sad. Have you ever had someone do something for you whether it was small or large, but something that you never forgot. I remember when I was a teenager, I was first learning the guitar, and one of the, um, one of the leaders in our youth program said, hey, you want to learn some more guitar? Because he was a very good player. Why don't you come on over to my house uh, on such and such a day, and I'll teach you a few things. And so we spent less than two hours together, and that was over 20 years ago, but I've never forgotten this man's kindness. As I think back on that moment, it just brings a warmth to my heart. I was loved and accepted and valued and seen. Something simple. And if we were to ask him today, he might not even remember that. People often remember the simple good things that you do for them. We know they often remember the bad things. They often remember the good as well. Dorcas was somebody... If she wasn't up front you know, in the glitzy, glamorous side of things, if there is such a thing. <laughs> you can have a coughing fit in front of people. It'll look great. <laughs> she was behind the scenes. But she was doing exactly what Jesus wanted her to do. She was following the path of Jesus laid out before her just as much as Peter was. If she had started preaching, she probably wouldn't have had the same impact that Peter had. And if Peter had started sowing, he wouldn't have been nearly as good as Dorcas was. He would have been off the path that God had given him. And so these widows, they were weeping because they missed someone, not because they missed someone giving them things. They missed the friend that they had found in Dorcas. Verse 40, but Peter put them all out. Not because he didn't want them there, but you'll recall previous stories where Jesus put people outside. Uh, even uh, the prophet Elijah, um, or Elisha, one of the two, put people outside when he was going to, to go about praying for the healing, the resurrection of the young boy. So he put them out and he knelt down and prayed. This wasn't a show about Peter, it was about what can God do? And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Now, if you've ever seen a dead body before, you know that the, the color has left the body. They, it's just not the prettiest thing to see. So imagine, all of a sudden, not only do her eyes open, but color returns to her face. Movement returns to her body. Uh, the rigor mortis that had set in disappears, melts away. She sits up looking there at Peter. And remember, death is asleep, so she maybe didn't even know she had died. Wait, what just happened? Well, you've been dead for a couple days. We have a few things to explain to you. Verse 41, then he gave her his hand like a gentleman, and he lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many did 
what? They believed on whom? The Lord. They didn't believe in Peter the Great. They believed upon the Lord. And then the final verse, it's interesting. It says, so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with whom? Simon the Tanner. Luke, in his, who's the author here, has a way of giving a little bit of spotlight to some of the lesser known characters. That's all we know about Simon, who was a tanner. But in Jewish cultures, among strict Jews, tanners were not highly regarded because if you're tanning, that means hides of, of animals. You first had to come in contact with the dead bodies of the animals, creating ceremonial uncleanness and defilement. And so if you're a strict Jew, you don't want to hang out around a tanner. Uh, plus, it was a gross and smelly job uh, on top of it. But Peter has evidenced that he is starting to change in his prejudices and his openness to other people. He makes his stay at Simon the Tanner's house. Little did he know what was about to happen to him next. Uh, because it's while he was there in Joppa that he received a vision from God. Now, we're going to talk about that next week. And it's a long passage, so I'm going to invite you to read ahead. Uh, between now and next week, read Acts chapter 10. We're not going to read every single verse. Read Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 through verse 18. If you do that, then you, you won't be missing things when we summarize and when we skip ahead verses next week. But it's a, it's a the perfect message. I didn't plan it this way. It's a perfect one for international Sabbath. So, what are we to learn from these two simple stories about Peter? Well, number one, it's not about Peter. It's about God and what God can do. Maybe some of us feel like we're a liability to God's cause. Oh, God, you don't want me to be involved. I know that they're trying to get people involved in church programs and outreach events, but but God, you know my heart, and I just can't do it. First of all, we don't get to decide who, who God calls. God gets to decide. Amen? Peter was a knucklehead when God first called him. And he still was a bit of a knucklehead at times. But God used him and helped him to grow. Can you say amen? So don't let your own foibles and character defects and rough-around-the-edges problems, don't let that hold you back from accepting the call of God. Now, we don't all, all get called to the same thing. Uh, all of us are called in different ways. Dorcas, as we talked about earlier, she was the behind-the-scenes kind of person, but her work was just as important. Because Peter, he traveled around, he moved on, but who was going to be there to love the people who sometimes got overlooked? Who was going to be there to be the stable presence in the lives of those widows who needed that kind of presence? Couldn't have been Peter. It was necessary for Dorcas to be there. And I don't know what your, all your gifts and your callings are, but I know that all of us have been called. If you've heard the voice of Jesus in your heart, Calling him to follow you, you've been called also to be a disciple maker. And God can and wants to use you. The God who worked in Jesus, in, through Jesus, Jesus as God, who worked in Peter's life to help him to grow, wants to help me to grow and you to grow as well. And the God that worked in Dorcas's life to use her in behind-the-scenes ways uh, wants to use us whatever way he's called us to, using our gifts and talents and abilities for him. So the simple question I end with today, are you willing to say yes to God's call? You may feel like a liability, but this morning, church, those watching on the live stream, God sees you as an asset. You are important for God's kingdom, and he wants to use you to make a difference in somebody's life this week. Are you, are you willing? Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father,
thank you for calling us. Thank you for using people that are broken just like us. And thank you for helping all of us to grow. Lord, show us how we can brighten the life of someone else this week. Show us how we can make a difference through kindness and love and words and service or, or, or proclaiming the good news. Whatever that looks like for us, give us our mission, Lord. Our hearts are open, and with your help, we are willing, and we will follow. This is our prayer. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let all God's called say amen and amen.